Let's see you come in. Y'all know. <laughs> Where you get popping? Where you doing this? You know, talk to the person. Let me do some stuff. Oh, there you go. Hi, Robert. Oh, you want to introduce yourself? I'm going to introduce myself to everybody. My name is, uh, my biological name is Donnell Andrew B. Uh, my friends call me Texas. Uh, I've been in Minnesota for around 10 years from Texas. I came up here after, uh, you know, some family issues. Uh, after the um, the housing crisis, you know, countrywide almost housing crisis. I was working for countrywide almost. But, uh, one of y'all that's meeting justice, we're here. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready. This is what he's ready. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm going to use myself. Uh, my name is Justice Wally. Um, I've been here for quite some while, quite some time. I lost my little past. I've been up there too long reading books. And um, I just started yesterday, so we're going to see how it goes. Thank you. Come on, girls, we ready to play. All right, I'm here to introduce this. I am the moderator, Stephen Davis. Hey, um, this is an awesome presentation from Young Scholars 103. It's the great debate, not that election crap, but the great debate, right? Topic. What's the best solution to end in generational poverty? And also, the lead to crisis. What's the lead to crisis in the black communities? So we're going to allow the brothers to give their spiel. It's about a total of three minutes, I mean three rounds. Get 25 minutes per person per round. Um, third round is for the Q&A. No, that's the fourth round, I'm sorry. Fourth round is for the Q&A. That's when you get on ask questions. Ask questions is now. Um, I would say ask questions and challenge the brothers, actually. Yeah. Don't tell them nothing, but challenge them. And um, be respectful, though. Don't boo boo people and spit on people. And, 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 and so, all right, we're going to kick it off. We got Texas one first. Let's go. One more five minutes. I was yeah. ready. <laughs> Yeah, so. All right, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to animate it, so I'm going to be sitting down and moving around a little bit. Uh, again, my name is, uh, my biological name is Donnell. Uh, everybody call me Texas. I'm a St. Paul uh, resident as of right now. Uh, I started in Blaine, and then I moved to Brooklyn Park and stuff like that. But get back to the topic, the topic is generational poverty. So um, how do we end generational poverty? I know that uh, I grew up. I grew up in a lower socioeconomic area. I grew up uh, on welfare. That's when they had the paper, the paper uh, food stamps. I don't know if anybody can remember that. But uh, I, I, I fondly remember growing up and not having, you know, food, clothes, um, school supplies, and all that stuff growing up. And uh, it was it was a challenge for me, just you know, going to school without without the things that I need and and being unprepared. Uh, I'm the oldest of 17 siblings. Um, back then it was six of us. Um, my mom had six, I was still the oldest. I was like uh, eight years old, and everybody else was seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Um, and uh, I know it was very hard for my mother, you know, a single mom, doing everything, doing everything she can possible to uh, <clears throat> support five kids herself. She did a good job, you know. Um, I can't, I can't minimize her uh, significance in her role in my life. She did the best job she could, and um, but I just, I just noticed that it was a challenge for her, you know, alone. Um, I would, if she had um, additional help there, you know, back then they didn't have, uh, they didn't have all the welfare stuff, they didn't have all the resources available. Um, if she she had she had the right opportunities and the right resources then um, that would have that would have made for us a, a, a more quality life for us. Um, so generational poverty to me it's not just about income because income is based on uh, what I was, income is based on outcome of your resources your command of resources your command of your land what you're doing in your community as far as a collective is concerned. 
because it's, it, it, it doesn't just it just doesn't fall on my back. It's just going to fall on this guy's back. We all a community, you know. Um, so to end generational poverty, we all have to we all have a part in it, you know. Each each one of us bring a gift to the table. Maybe one of you guys might cook. I know how to um, I know how to network with uh, with adolescents as far as educating them and stuff is concerned. Maybe someone else knows how to knit, crochet, or something like that. But Lord, what I'm saying is that each each one of us is an influential part in the neighborhood. Each one of us affects the next, even though we might not speak to each other, even though we might not um, associate with each other. Um, in a neighborhood, each each person is a vital part. Um, so, uh, just to recap again, income is based on outcome. To end generational poverty, we have to have a, a command of land, resources, and opportunities in the neighborhood. Say, uh, uh, I know when I came here to Minnesota, I didn't, you know, I came here on vacation, and um, quickly I, 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 I networked to, to meet other people that that were in the same pro that were in the same programming that I was in. Like I was into cars at that point in time, so I'm looking for you know internships with with dealerships and stuff like that. So I utilize, I utilize the resources in that area and plan. Um, we, can make this, we can make this culture also, but I wrote that being black and beautiful means nothing until you're black and powerful. The world is ruled by power, not blackness. So, so with that said, it's like a, a, a cultural esteem is necessary. You gotta, you gotta have the knowledge base of who you are or who you are, but you, you, you're not supposed to end it at that. In order to, in order to make progress within a community, you have to network outside that community with different, with, with different people from different cultural backgrounds, and get establish an integrity within business. Um, nobody will go as far for you in the community as you do. So, um, we have in Minnesota in each, in each state we have counties. Counties is uh, it's like to me I, I would compare it to like many. Many precincts, many many states, or many counties, or, or counties and cities. Um, in each one of these cities, they make up a whole called the state. So, <clears throat> within this community called Minneapolis, <clears throat> no one will go as hard for Minneapolis as Minneapolis will go hard for itself. So, in order to to end generational poverty, to end generational poverty, you got to start start from here. We don't want to start from a global scale. I don't want to start from New York and be like, okay, we're going to end generational poverty in, in, in South Africa and Madagascar. We got to start here. We start from we start from home, and then then we then we branch out. But if we're not doing good for ourselves, as far as as far as income, as far as educating our children, as far as as far as um, as far as socializing within the community, we cannot expect people on a larger scale to agree with us or even or jump in the cab. Jumping the cab means uh, mean support, support. So we got to gain support from a local area first. When you gain support from a local area, um, you're imp you're improving. I would I suggest we improve our the education and the socializing of the children first because education is well, socialization is synonymous to education. What that means is social. What that means is basically who's ever teaching your children. Who's ever teaching your children whether they're teaching them, misinforming them, or who's ever engaging with your children, your children will will, will end up to, to mock their mock their beliefs, mock their interests. So we really have to engage with the previous generation so that when they're when they're at my level, when they're 34, 35, 36 years old, they can be knowledgeable past their years. I would suggest we invest to end generational poverty. Um, one of the solutions is to invest in our youth, so that they can be uh, equipped with knowing how to knowing how to take care of the community and, and, and grow the community and, and culture the community itself. Um, and we start we start we start from home. Everything starts from inside the house, inside the community, and then you branch out. You start inside the house. You make sure everything's inside the community is is is, is making. Make some progress for yourself, uh, improving yourself before you go outside to another state and, and be a model for other states. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Another, another way to end generational property, uh, well, there, there are many ways to end generational property. It's not just a few ways, it's not just my way, it's not just justice ways, just this way. Generational property affects us all, even on, on, on a large scale. Blaming, blaming, a particular, blaming a particular area, particular people, gives your power away. Even though, even though the underlying issue may be the fact, when, when, you, when you place blame on someone, you're giving your power away. You're not, you're not being proactive, you're not, you're not empowering self. Empowerment is, 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 is very important in our community also. Empowerment, <clears throat> what empowerment means to, my, means to me is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, what empowerment, empowerment means to me is, uh, is it, we'll go back to uh, education, um, knowing who we are as, 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 you know, as people, like, uh, you know, um, when I say knowing who we are, it's like actually getting, get some of our history that's not just textbook history, you know? Um, get, some, get some history out of the community, get some history from someone that's older than you that's, that's probably your sex or something. Like, um, if I was seeking some information about, about who I am, I'm going to probably look for someone that closely resembles me, like this guy here. I'm going to ask him about uh, some stuff that happened 3,050 uh, years ago. I'm going to ask him, hey, how was this going on, and, and how, did they, how, did, how did it affect you? How did, how did you manage? And, you know, and based on his answer, I can either improve, improve the outcome, or I can just, just go about, how it, go about the, not improving the situation. Uh, <clears throat> generational poverty. <clears throat> generational poverty is uh, is 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 um, generational poverty has to do with the lack of structure. We don't have we don't have structure around, then um, things tend to fall to the wayside. Um, so, so you have to you have to lay a foundation, lay a foundation, lay a foundation to where lay a foundation to where uh, people can build off of. Any any structure or any any community that's that's really successful or a business that's successful, they lay down a foundation. They lay down a foundation of trust uh, of an idea. Uh, and they follow through with their intentions. Uh, for instance, um, this library, before they built this library, they had the intentions of there's going to be books here. They wrote it down and they followed through, they followed through with their plans until, until the windows was up, until everything was complete. So to end, to end generational poverty, one of the solutions is um, build, a, build, a foundation, build a foundation within the community so that the community can, um, the community can have a part and, and following through to ensure that to ensure that the goal of educating educating the youth, um, strengthening the youth, uh, providing providing opportunities for the people in the community can can be complete. We got to follow through with that. So we, we real real strategy happens behind closed doors like this here. So in order to improve our situation, we have to draw up a, a plan. Draw up a plan. We can get it. Go to the county clerk and get it notarized, and we have to all each have to, each each one of us has to follow through with the intent of with the with the intent of making the community better. Um, foundations laid in the past often often support foundations laid in the past successful foundations laid in the past often support um, future. Future success. It promotes future success. If these foundations are badly laid, there can be no future. There can be no structure, and generational poverty will will cycle itself again. Generational poverty is a cycle. Um, to me, I see things in patterns. I see things in patterns and cycles. Um, as long as you keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, not going hard for self. Then things will continue to cycle down and, and, and get worse. 
it's going to get worse before it gets better. And like I said, nobody will go as hard for us but us. So if we're not, if we, we don't have a collective esteem about self, uh, a knowledge of self, then anyone, it's like taking candy from a baby. It's like anyone can come in and, and, and say, okay, you're, this is what's going to go on. This is what's going to go on, and, 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 and that's what's going to go on. Uh, So um, in, in the state of Minnesota, the unemployment rate has, has, is, is terrible for, for, for the black community. <clears throat> and to end generational poverty, uh, the unemployment rate is terrible for, for, uh, for, for the black community. Um, the median dropped 14%, making Minnesota's uh, unemployment rate or job a job market worse than Mississippi. Um, that's terrible. To improve the situation, to improve this cycle that we're we're about to, that we're embarking on, each one of us embarking on, because this is happening right now. Um, I'm, I'm always I, I get a million jobs, but I believe that people are unprepared, and the people in the community are unprepared for these positions because a they're not they're not. Um, they're not trained. Uh, they don't. They don't utilize the resources, or they don't know where the resources are. Um, so that's very important to me: is uh, ensuring that opportunities, resources are available for those in the black community to improve the situation of generational poverty. Uh, generational poverty also has to do with socialization. I'm gonna tell a personal story. Um, I'm not perfect by a long shot. I made mistakes. Uh, I'm not perfect, you know, but um, I, I seek to improve myself in the conditions of my community each and every day. I improve on myself so that I can improve on, on, on external variables, but I invest in myself first. Um, when I, I'm, I'm, I'm contracted to teach over 50, 50 schools from elementary all the way to high schools, and I get at least 10 jobs every day. Uh, I am privileged to make my own schedule during the week. So if I don't want to work at a school, or I feel, or if I worked at a school and then you know I had a bad experience, I don't have to work at that school. So on and so forth. It goes both ways because if the school doesn't want me to teach there, they won't have me there. But I haven't. I've kept my reputation pretty, pretty clean. Um, when I, I, I I'm gonna go back to go back earlier to what I was saying. Socialization is synonymous to education. Socialization. Education is synonymous to socialization. When I'm in the schools, like uh, I'm usually like one of the only one of the only males, one of the only black males there, um, and I don't I don't have an issue with that because I'm there for the students. My issue is that when I'm in these schools, because because of the socialization in the households, it starts in the house first. Like I said, it starts in the community. Starts everything starts inside. It starts inside the inside house, inside you. Um, so, my experience is that when I'm inside these schools, generally the the the, the white kids and everything they love me and everything, but it's 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 the black students that they double check my information because they're not used to getting information or getting getting um, knowledge from a source a source of used to getting knowledge from a source like me, and that's that's kind of like uh, it starts in the home. So. In order for generational poverty to end, I'm gonna throw this in there. In order for generational poverty to end, we gotta we gotta engage with our youth. Because if I tell my youth, okay, if I tell the youth, okay, two plus two equals four, and they can't get the information from me, and they don't trust and trust me, and they get it from somebody else, they, somebody else can really kind of steer them a different way. But if they can't they trust in their own peers, their their own their own peers, then then we can't we can't improve our situation. We can't gain cultural esteem, we can't gain any cultural, a cultural front for ourselves because we can't gain either one because we can't trust, we can't trust information from one another. We can't do business with one another if you can't trust a simple form of information. Now we've gone through this, through this system for 12 years. For 12 years, I've been teaching for like 10 years. For 10 years I'm going through the same thing just about weekly, and I'm not gonna say every day because I, I have some great experiences teaching. But we could usually get like a student that just 
a black student, they might be a male, they might be a female. That just, they don't listen to the information I'm giving to them. Like, they just don't believe it. Like, uh, I gotta go double check with uh, with, with uh, Miss, Miss, Miss Anderson downstairs across the street. Like, you don't have to check with them. I got the syllabus right here. Actually, I had to draw this syllabus up before I, before I even talk this class so that they know, so that the school knows I know what I'm teaching them and, and so on and so forth. So, so in order to get out of this cycle that we're in, <clears throat> We gotta trust information from one another. Um, in the community, we gotta trust information from one another in the community. Um, so that we can so that we can improve the qualities of our of our homes, include 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 improve the quality of socialization with others. Because if we don't know ourselves, how can we be good to anyone else? If we're not doing good inside as far as knowledge, as far as information within ourselves, we can't really be a quality to anyone else. We can't really be effective. People can all, all, always kind of come in and, and switch things around if they want to. But um, so that, that's my story about the substitute teaching thing. Um, again, I do enjoy teaching, I really do. But I understand that <clears throat> as far as <clears throat> socialization is concerned, um, socialization to me is, is, is in relation to business because in order for in order for you to trust me in business, in order for you to trust me in business, where am I going? In order for you to do business with someone, you have to trust them. So uh, if, if a black person wants to do business with another black person, they got to trust each other first. And that trust, go, that trust starts from early on when we're little kids. If we're if we're conditioned and programmed not to trust each other or, or not have knowledge itself, then when we turn 18, we get into business. Then it's, it's less likely for us to even gain a socioeconomic foundation for for ourselves because we don't trust each other business. We, and it seems like uh, seems like uh, it doesn't seem like anything. But that's all I have, right? All right. <laughs> Brother Justice, you're welcome. I got a really big team, got a really big green. No, no. I just get a pop, I just, you know. You know how they used to do you in school. Stand up, straight. All right, we're gonna get a pop on that because uh, there's a few things he said um, I didn't totally agree with. And before I get into that, I'm gonna get into something that's a little bit more profound. Because in Minneapolis, nearly 30% of uh, people that's living in the state is uh, under, under poverty. And 40% of them are immigrants, 45% of them are African Americans, and 55% of them are women, single women, who basically been you know, on their own because uh, the guy decided to let me make a child with you and move around. But the thing that I argue with the city councilor is that they apply its power to ensure that every worker in the city remain a minimum of $15. And if I ensure this, that minimum wage should be $15, this can get us out of poverty. For the reason why, because if you do five times 80 hours, we give you $1,200. Now you take that monthly and say that's $2,400. You times that $2,400 with 12 months, that give you $28,800. That right there will give you above the property line because the property guideline in 2015 was $23,450. So now you're actually making a little bit more money to actually invest, to go on trips, and do things that you would like to do. Because the reason we wonder why blacks are so behind economically, like he was mentioning, it's the aspect that blacks do not comprehend. It's the aspect that blacks do not com uh, comprehend. It's the importance of building wealth. Once an individual are able to find the foundation within their group, they will keep the money within their racial group, and then they will be able to help the next individual that's like myself and him that's trying to get off the ground. You know, because if you, if you really do the knowledge, do you know that the Jews build business with Jewish people? Right. They hire Jewish people. Yeah. You know, uh, they buy and spend with the Jews, and so does the Somalians. I'm gonna keep it thorough. 
But there's nothing wrong with that, but that just, like I said, is just a basic concept that we can't comprehend. Because did you know that the Jewish community has changed hands 18 times before it leaves its community? But the black people only do it once. And we make a lot of money. I mean, for real, we make a lot of money. We can flip packs, we can flip keys, and flip tires, and 24s, but what is we doing with it? We can't even pawn that in a pawn shop. You know why? Because they're gonna lowball you. Why? Because they're gonna tell you, as soon as you took it, this is a liability, this is not an asset. How many people know what an asset is? I'm sure y'all do. But the asset is basically saying the worth the value. Asset is not words, it's numbers. And if you can't read numbers, then you can't tell an asset from a hole in the ground. It's just that simple. Because 93% blacks that's getting killed in America is by other blacks. And did you know that the black leaders take the money from the people and they send the money back to the common master who they borrowed the money from to send us through the propaganda? So let's do it. Propaganda plus genocide equal property. And that's pretty much how things work. But it's only 6% of the black people that actually put the money back into their community. But still, the Jews are going to always be above the poverty line. Now, the reason why I'm going to that is because in the Holocaust, in 1933 to 1945, the Jews was targeted by Hitler because he said that they was the problem, they was the reason why there's all this problem going on in this world. And in World War I, he felt like the Jews had stab the Germans in the back to be allies with another country. But they killed five million of them. But in our Holocaust, which is 1890 to 1945, they killed 60,000, an estimate. I don't know for sure, but the estimate is 60,000. But they killed less of us and killed more of them and they was able to overcome and prosper and so can we. It's not our fault, it's just a compulsive disorder, a habit of killing our own. It's a compulsive uh, disorder habit of taking from our own. It's a compulsive uh, disorder habit from, I can be quicker to lie to you, but I'm gonna be all right with the police. I know how to fix my mind and say, sir, thinking like that, gonna keep you in problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about this, you gotta think big, because as long as we can get past the, concept, the, the concept or the consumption of material things, and actually think about life generational, we can be able to set reigns like Jay-Z guy. <laughs> cause he's the best person I can use cause he came from the projects and did music. So I'm gonna say somebody that I know everybody can relate to because he talked about how he sold drugs. But not to deviate from that, I just wanna know. And I'm gonna ask this a question because anyone in here who ever struggled with poverty know how extremely expensive it is to be poor. Yeah. Think about this. You get paid, you living check to check, but you're not making $15. I don't know everybody's salary, but I'm just saying a minimum wage. You gotta pay your lights, you gotta pay your rent, you gotta pay your gas, you gotta make it back and forth to work, and you gotta get food and accounting what money? Give you $25 in stamps? They tell you, you can, we can help you one time. Man, I might fall off again. This is life, you know what I'm saying? But this is the thing that we're living in because 50 million people in the United States live below the poverty line. So for a family of four and one in every four Americans live in poverty. So that's still 40 million people who still have jobs that's still below the poverty line. How is that? And that's 1% of the equation of people that's actually jobless. How is that 1% affect the whole 40 million people but them 10 million people who jobless affect the 40 million people who got jobs? Some people might work two, three jobs. Some people might do a side job because they don't want to get taxed all the time. Because I always build about earned income, portfolio income, and you have passive income. Earned income is earn, and then you pay taxes, then you spend. Because the way your checks is generated, that they garnish the taxes before you can even get your money. But people who got wealth, what they do is, they earn money, they spend, 
Then they pay taxes because that's how we hear about them always going to jail for tax infraction. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, if, give me the ability to call you <laughs> and be like, I don't want to pay my taxes in this check. Let me pay on the next check. You know what I'm saying? Because this, because if they got the option, why can't I? But one thing he said, Texas is black. He said black property, black property, but black property isn't black culture, it's America culture. That's what it is. It ain't our fault. You know, and the thing that we have to realize is that the person that's actually trying to do something is going to always be interrupted by the person that's usually ain't doing what? Nothing. All the time. All the time. We all want power. But how can we get power? The best way we can get power To unite and shake hands and everything, that's cool. But sometimes that kumbaya don't cut it. I'm going to keep it there, though, because black is necessary, but it's not sufficient enough for me. I don't care if you're black. Because if you're black, you're going to still, I remember the Uncle Tom's that sold, sold my people out. Still, niggas out here still snitching on other niggas. Still people still taking from other people. And some women are still sleeping with they Best man, you know how that goes. Like best girl man. So the first thing we have to do is really check people ingredients and make sure that they're healthy for your diet. It's a nutrition fact. Because if you think about what's keeping us in the economic impact, it's flat rages. Not having the proper privilege to operate a motor vehicle because they take away your license. Most jobs that hiring, you gotta have license. And they don't care if you got a class D. They like, just come on, we'll give you the class A. We'll make you get that money, we'll put you on the road. But this is ways that they keep you in problem. Another way is high rate of arrest for marijuana and hard crack. Get that? Marijuana and hard crack. This is what black people get caught. How is it that 60% of the jail population from 1980 to 2008 grew from 500,000 so 2.3 million inmates, the majority of them was black and Latinos because of these basic little simple things that they consider one to cash you on. Um, you also have low salaries, you have business failure, disasters, no ongoing education, you have history, lack of history as well, drugs, sex, rap videos, because they just is, they, they got a job and their job is to deceive us. Divorce, evictions, three months or more of unemployed. Because uh, most of us can't afford to go two weeks unemployed. I know I can't. Child support gonna eat me up and I'll be in jail. Like, they gonna ask me why you in here? Cause you don't give me time to look for a job. Shit, it take time. But they don't wanna hear that. Cause they want their money. That's all they know. We want our money. The lack of fatherhood, the single mothers. And then you gotta remember the non-custodial sentence. Non-custodial sentence is what they catch us on. And that is community service. They get you on parking tickets. They get you on this ticket, that ticket. You spit on the ground, sanitation, you, you, you urinate outside. Why well, can't you urinate outside? I came from the dirt. Shit, I'm, it might be a blessing. You don't know what creature I'm feeding. You know, but this isn't the way that they can say, this is how I can get money from you. And then they give you Planned Parenthood. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And poverty is the worst form of violence because poverty is a lack of knowledge that has to be challenged. And people think intelligence solves problems and produce money, but without finance and intelligence, the money will soon be gone. Because if you just get the money and just say, uh, here, I'm just gone. And you don't actually have no educational concept of where you're putting your money into and have the knowledge or actually hire someone that can do that, then we'll be okay. I mean, I'm the type of individual that I will hire an accountant and then hire another accountant to make sure that my first accountant ain't stealing money from out my account. I mean, y'all would do that. Y'all just hire one accountant, huh? And, he, and I wish I could be y'all accountant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because this is how it's basically gonna work. Because 
if you think about this, remember slavery. And I'm, I, I'm drawn to this because I got to give you the history of it. He touched on it, but I'm going to finish. That's how I operate. Uh, in slavery, you think they just beat us up and not fed us? Man, how the hell are we going to work and build shit? How the hell are we going to invent lights and refrigerators and stuff? You know what I'm saying? No, they had us working out we was educating, but that's a big part of history that they choose not to tell nobody. Because it's a thing called post-dramatic property disorder. And post-dramatic property disorder is the first thing people need to understand primarily is that the slavery composed upon our people. It was a study. They wanted to study us for some hundreds of years. And the reason was for the study, it was for post-slavery. Because they knew that marketing in his mind are going to think that they had a free will to buy what they want, but they pretty much pushing it up on you. Look at TV, you see a, a Burger King commercial or a Burger King advertising, the woman got her mouth wide open with a big ass sandwich going there like she couldn't make or sex to her. This is sex, sex sells. So they know I can put this into you, put this out there, you're going to image, because remember, Abraham Lincoln said it was impossible for one man to run 300 slaves. He said, let them free, but control their culture, control their mind, and control their body. Because if you control the mind, the body going to follow. And what happened? They still got us in control. And somebody come in right now, y'all probably say, yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. Because this is, this is how they do but this is how we programmed because we was taught from parents to parenthood to parenthood to look down and be scared. I'm gonna give you an example. I was working at a job. And the job that I was working with, it was my fault because I should have asked and negotiated on my salary. But the man felt like, I'm just gonna throw you on the schedule all day. I don't feel, care about your availabilities. And it was a cool, it was a cool, easy job, but he had me like seven to seven. And I'm like, man, I got kids. You know, I got a life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know I'm black, but I got I, I love my kids too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, and first thing he did, he put me on the dishwasher. Which was fine. Easy money. Put it in the machine, let it the temperature get 150 something Fahrenheit, take it out. It was easy going. And I said, how much do I get paid? He said, nine dollars. I said, damn, minimum wage is nine fifty. I quit. <laughs> now, how many of y'all quit? Or how many of y'all say, you know what? I'm gonna give him two weeks. Even though he said F my bell bill, <laughs> I'm gonna give him two weeks. Or how many of y'all stay with the job? Because you need the income. Because if you stay with a job that's paying you below the minimum wage, then that's basically saying, he basically saying you ain't and you're basically saying, I'd rather settle for anything. We don't have that business. I mean, basically, we don't have to settle for anything. Because settling for things is not going to help us get out of poverty. Texas Black said, he kept saying, let's work on Minnesota. Let's not work on any other states. Let's work on, uh, let me stand up. <clears throat> Y'all mind if I stand up a little bit? <laughs> Stretch my legs, man, because it's going to get serious in here now. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Seven minutes? Cool, let's wrap this up. Texas Black made a couple points, man. He kept saying, um, yeah, let's focus on Minnesota. Let's not focus on South Africa. Well, let's focus on here. Let's not go all the way to New York. You know what he just gave y'all? Pseudos. Y'all know what pseudos is? Anybody? Nobody? Pseudos. I encourage everybody to look up pseudos because the statement that he gave him was a fragment sentence. And you know what a fragment sentence is? It's when you disconnect the main idea from the main topic. And this is basically what he did. He said, yeah, this is the way you do it. This is the way you get out of it. And 
I grew up this way and I grew up that way. We all grew up messed up. We all here had our own convictions. But is he giving any solutions? He ain't even teaching about the history of how we got into poverty. Because I'm gonna say this again. Anyone that struggled through poverty know how extremely it is, or extremely how expensive it is to be poor. That's all I'm gonna leave with that. But what he said, if you got it. Can you hold this? All right, all right. So again, there's there's several there's several um, <coughs> solutions to end the generational poverty. There's not there's not one way to skin a cat. I'm, I'm a firm believer that there's several ways to skin a cat. Uh, I'm not going to mi minimize the significance of what uh, Brother Justice was saying, but I, I will say that uh, in the black community, crime is interracial. Interracial is I N T R A. R A C I A L. Intraracial. Intraracial means like if you go to the if you go to the if you go to the Hmong community, the Hmongs more than likely gonna be fighting with each other. If you go to the Asian community, I really more than likely the Asians are gonna be fighting with each other. If you go to the white community, it's over. If you go to Mexico in the area, they're gonna be fighting with each other. Crime is interracial. So with with the with the uh, perpetuating that uh, black people are doing each other the worst is to me, that's that's uh, that's make believe, like uh, Red Riding or something, or Santa Claus. It's because each each neighborhood and each community, you know, crime is based on more than likely a person that's going to commit crime against another person is going to be the same race. You go to Asian communities, and once again, you go to Asian community, they're going to be probably beefing over cars. It's not going to be a uh, it's not going to be an essay. Uh, Mexican do, crime is interracial. So you go to black community, black people is gonna be into with each other. You go to the Asian community, Asian community is gonna be in cahoots with each other. So uh, perpetuating a, a negative stereotype is, 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 is misinformation to me because that makes us look at each other in a bad light. Um, if you keep on perpetuating this mis misinformation, okay? Um, there, there, there are things in the community that are going on, you know what I'm saying? But that's in every community, not just in the black community. The black community um, is, 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 is basically glorified in, in the media life for, for being this way or that way. But you're not supposed to, I wouldn't be as quick to fall for the, for the okie dog, you know, because that's, that's Hollywood. Okay, so this one of the things. Crime is interracial. To end, to end generational poverty and, and, and another topic, uh, another question is what the legal crisis in the black community. Um, when we say crime is interracial, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and relate that to uh, to to the uh, to police to police harassment. I believe that the structure from inside of the authoritarian system structure should be should be uh, should be reestablished from the inside out. I don't agree with them every time I see them. Every time I see authority figure in the car or anything, I don't feel safe. I have I have several stories. I'll leave that for another time. I have several stories. And I don't have a record in Minnesota. I've been here 10 years. I've never, uh, I've only been, I only got jammed up. I only got jammed up once and that was a traffic ticket. But that one, that one incident was, was extreme because I got a pistol pulled off on me. I got kicked out the car by the car movement. It was all right. I don't know what deep into that. But uh, historical trends, historical trends, and, and supporting self-defeating acts can con continue the cycle of generational poverty. Uh, for instance, uh, a self-defeating tactic is uh, a self-defeating tactic is like us is in the black community. Us um, regurgitate some of these some of these low-budget lyrics. When I say that, like like okay, seeing a, a three-year-old know all the Gucci Man, I, I not listen to it. I'm not gonna sit here and say I don't listen to it. I do listen to rap music, but I don't entertain I don't entertain the ideas as life. But you know. The little kids, and again, socialization is synonymous to education. Little kids look at, they listen to this stuff, and they they they, they relate it to real life because there's not not anybody like me in their life. 
or another guy, or, 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 you know, someone else in their life saying, hey, no, 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 that's just TV. That's not real life. That's not what they're really doing in real life. So, so when, when, when they're saying these, these type of spells, like, oh, I'm going to shoot, shoot my brother over there, and then I'm going to step on his toe, you know, that's not really perpetuating, that's not really improving our social, our socialism toward each other. You know, you say these bad lyrics, and as soon as you look at me, you're gonna entertain, you're gonna entertain the lyrics subconsciously. So you, you say you're gonna kill somebody that, that looked like me, as soon as you see me, it's like there's not gonna there's gonna, there's gonna be uh there's gonna be some guards put up, there's gonna be a separation of, of trust and integrity. And um, the foundation of any any city, any town is is, is trust. You, you know I mean you, you solidify that that foundation of trust of uh a trust in, 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 in a trust, yeah. Foundation of any business is trust and trust. Um, our, this is a random fact. Eighty percent of the city's eighty percent of the city's budget is, is is paid by is paid by us by black people. So to me that means like when in, in any at any given time when we're out here you know carrying on our normal lives, you know. Um, when you see a, a person, when I see a cop, they're, they're mainly going to look for you to pull up because they know that, hey, you can't afford the ticket. So if you can't afford the ticket, it, the interest goes up. You know 